Well, the clouds have broken apart. We have sapphire skies, golden African sun. The siesta is over. This is Safari Live. Good afternoon everybody and a warm welcome from Juma Game Reserve here in South Africa with Safari Live. My name's Tara, joining me on camera is Craig <laughs> and we also have Byron out on the other vehicle along with Senzo and back in front of control we do have Alice and Chantel and we also have a special guest appearance all the way from Mara James and he's going to be looking for lions for you this afternoon so exciting it is absolutely wonderful to be out this afternoon as I say it is beautiful temperatures here 25 degrees uh, 77 Fahrenheit it is lovely but I think it's definitely time that the animals need to stop siestering now and let's get heading out there and seeing what we can find in the African bush today. If you'd like to join us, please do. This is a live safari, so we have no idea what's going to happen. It all unfolds in front, right in front of us. And if you would like to join in, ask any questions, answer any of ours, then it's hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or the feed on Facebook and YouTube as well. So there's plenty of ways to get in touch, so please do. It's always great to hear from you. And let's see what we can find. Now we have actually taken a look around the uh, hyena den just behind me here to see if we've got any movement. So we came by yesterday and there was actually the female with the cub out, uh, but it looks like they're not showing their faces today. I was really hoping they might be out just enjoying the sunshine, having a nice snooze before they head out later on this afternoon to go and find food. But I'm not giving up hope completely. We are going to take a little drive around the termite mound on our way out, just in case the sleeping may be around the back, or they might even be just on the ground in some of the shade. So hoping, keeping my fingers crossed for us that we can maybe see a hyena. And then we're going to head out down towards the dams and the, the drainage line, see if we can scratch around for any uh, sign of cats this afternoon. But I think we're gonna head to Byron. Apparently he has found something quite unusual this time of day, so enjoy that. We have indeed, and look, it's moving everyone. A beautiful Scops owl. Now, this is such a wonderful surprise. The smallest owl in the region, or in this area, or actually in Africa, I believe, the Scops owl. Very, very tiny little owl, similar in size to the pearl spotted owl, but a little bit smaller and very well camouflaged. But it's so nice to see these little owls during the day. It was calling earlier, but we cheated a little bit because we saw we actually saw this owl earlier um, in between drive and he hasn't moved. So I thought I'd come and have a look and see if he's still sitting here, and he is indeed fortunately for us and I thought it would be wonderful to show you the owl. Uh, Rose you say a day owl. See what they do is they perch themselves on trees and they sit and rest and then get active at night but they do occasionally call during the day. As I said we did hear him calling and that's how we found him. So the Scops owl and also the pearl spotted owl will also do that at times. This is one of my favorite little owls. I do really, really enjoy. Always enjoy seeing these owls. Paddy, you're a new viewer. Good afternoon, Paddy. Wonderful of you to join us. And, and you say what an amazing owl it is. And it is tiny, everyone. That owl is very small. It's only about 17 centimeters tall, so about the size of my hand. Not very big at all. Maybe a little bit bigger. But um, but very, very small owl, the smallest owl that we have in the area. 
See how it's just turned its head. It's obviously resting and dozing off a little bit. And later it'll probably go off and look for... Oh, Snazzy, you can see the little talons of this owl too. Yeah, you can see them holding on to that branch. Oh, they, um... oh, there we go. That's a nice look at those. You can see those little, little talons of the owl. And so well camouflaged. Doesn't it blend in perfectly with that bark of the dead tree? Now this little bird when it flies around at night will try catch insects, maybe even during the day too. Insects and little rodents perhaps. Um, and maybe frogs and geckos. Well, frogs in summer obviously, there are no frogs out at the moment. But you can see how well camouflaged it is. Look at that, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Very nice view of it. And it's actually very close to one of the houses. So, what a great start. My name is Byron, and on camera with me this afternoon is Senzo. And it's great to have all of you with us. Now, as I said, we're very close to, we're actually right in the, in the, or next to the one house. Um, but as I said, it's been sitting here for um, for most of the day, and it didn't move. So I thought we have to show you, just to show you that even when we're not on drive, we're still having a look out for interesting birds and interesting little creatures to show you. Always listening to the bush, and hopefully we find something that we can show you. Now this morning I was not very lucky. <laughs> I didn't find much at all. So I'm hoping my luck changes. I'm going to head towards some of the dams. It's quite a warm afternoon. It was cool and chilly this morning but it's warmed up beautifully. Very very nice temperature currently. There's a beautiful apple leaf tree. Maybe do a few trees. I know Tara was doing some trees earlier today but this this is a beautiful apple leaf it gets a name apple leaf from well apparently if you crunch the the leaves or bend the leaves in half it sounds almost like biting into an apple i do think you need a bit of an imagination for it but that's apparently where the name apple leaf comes from the crunchiness of those leaves and they are green throughout the year Some cultures refer to it as the rain tree. And the reason for that is um, the locals would often sit under these trees for shade and they would feel little droplets of water dropping down on them. And they called it the rain tree. But what it was is the spittle bugs. We get little spittle bugs that draw moisture out of the leaves. And what happens is these spittle bugs then, the moisture passes through, the liquid passes through the spittle bugs very, very quickly. And they then secrete it and it drops down, little droplets of secretion or water really. That's basically what it's made up of. And these little droplets then felt like rain and the locals would refer to it as the rain tree. But it's from the spittle bugs that sit on the apple leaf. Oh wow, it sounds like Tara's in luck already. She's got a hyena at the den. Let's go have a look. Well, hopefully we're gonna have a lucky streak and hopefully starting with the hyena. So we've come to the back of where we were. So we're literally on the opposite side to where we were of the hyena den. And sharp-eyed Craig actually spotted Ntima, the little cub. Um, which is just in the thick bush and definitely the height helped. Uh, there was no way I could see her. I was literally trying to see where and Tima's just somewhere in the bush there. She, it, she is popping her head up every so often um, but I don't want to get too close and disturb her. Uh, but then we do have Mother who I can see why we couldn't see her from the other side because she's very flat and there's actually a little ridge of the termite mound just in front of her that would have hidden her. 
I was trying to work out how, how we weren't able to see her from there, but that's obviously why. So, definitely uh, worth checking around the back of the hyena den. And you can see the hyena den, this side is in shadow. And it's quite possible that the hyena den was actually in shadow where the female was lying. But as, he, as the sun has crept over the sky, uh, the female is now exposed. So obviously she's enjoying the rays. Sunbathing, it's not too hot for her at the moment. There's a nice lacquer breeze coming through. And you can see the golden fur of her. I, I think she's actually not too old in a hyena because they do tend to get lighter with age and they do tend to get shorter fur with age as well. So I think she's probably middle aged. But as I say, I haven't really had a good look at her yet, so I'm just uh, taking from what I'm seeing at the moment. Now for these guys, nocturnal, ac nocturnal activity is the norm. But like we were saying, they do like to sleep and enjoy the sun as well. And Lisa! Lisa thinking it was a snake to begin with. Oh, uh, not a good place to land, buddy. <laughs> Franklin giving an alarm call and actually flying straight over to where the hyenas are. I really thought that would actually wake them up. <laughs> I wonder what actually disturbed... Yeah, hello, good morning, lady. <laughs> the, the, um, the hyenas just looking up now over her shoulder to see what was all the commotion. <laughs> nah, not worth my bother. So I wonder what did disturb the Franklin. No, apparently nothing too much, seeing as the Franklins decided to have a bit of a, a dust bathe. That's the first time she's lifted up her head since we've actually been here, so I wonder if she was in a very deep sleep. Oh, it is absolutely delightful, Tamara, soaking in the sun. Tamara also wishes she could be doing that, and it is. It's one of the best things in the world soaking in the African rays. I did wonder if she was going to uh, get up and reposition herself. And there goes the little one to go and join her. Oh, we might be lucky. She might go and suckle. Shall we go around to the front? Because it looks like they've gone around to the front of the den. We might be in luck. Looked like the cub was hungry. So we're going to reposition ourselves, see if we can get a better view. Slightly more open around the front as well. They are, aren't they snazzy? The hyenas are super pretty. And unfortunately I think hyenas get a bit of a bad press and a lot of people don't like hyenas. But you know what? A lot of documentaries, and I think The Lion King added to it as well, uh, that yes, hyenas are scavengers and they will steal kills, but hyenas are actually a very good predator in their own right. And lions will often steal kills from hyenas. And quite often what's been missed is the hyenas are actually trying to get their kill back off the lions. <laughs> that they are absolutely beautiful, especially when they're younger. They can look a little bit uh, <laughs> moth-eaten when they're a bit older, bless them. So we came in on that bit, so yes, if we'd have come in on the other side, we would have seen her there. There she is. There's the little one. <laughs> Hello. 
But yeah, I think we're going to just keep pulling around. Oh, is she going to go there? Okay. Just in case she disappears. Now, it is quite difficult to determine male and female hyena, so especially at such a young age. Generally speaking, females are a bit more boisterous than males. Um, females have a lot of testosterone in their body, uh, which actually helps them to outcompete the males. And because of that, uh, their genitalia actually looks like that of a male, which is very unusual, obviously, in the mammal world. Oh yeah, a nice resting spot. You can see that's one of the favorites. That's actually where we saw them yesterday. A nice little pillow and a very nice shadow. I miss the name, Dee 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 Gus. Oh, Geeky Geeky Beth. <laughs> Great name, Geeky Beth. <laughs> so Nocturnal loves sleeping and loving the sun. Geeky Beth thinks that she's a hyena as well. <laughs> I wonder if you could hear the whistle of the bird that was just calling. Any sharp-eared people, if you could hear it. Hashtag Safari Live, what bird was just calling? I'll try and point it out again if it does call again. So yes, I believe uh, the, the bold nature of this cub. And incidentally, you can call uh, a hyena offspring, a pup or a cub. It's one of those funny ones that you can use either, either, because originally hyenas were in the dog order or suborder and uh, they got changed over into the cat suborder in the whole taxonomic grouping. So I think that's why you can actually call them pups or cubs, but I suppose technically now they're in the cat order, suborder. It would be better to call them cubs, but yeah. Z saying such a cute cub. It really is. But as I say, I think possibly the personality of this little one may have made people believe that it's a, a female, and that could possibly be. Um, it will also depend on the rank of the mother. So if the mother's a very high ranking female, then her offspring are more likely to be a lot more boisterous with other cubs because they are higher ranking. Even males will be quite boisterous towards the other cubs. Um, but yeah, as I say, if you can get two cubs together and, and you can see if one's more boisterous than the other, then that's a possibility that it's a female. But it's very, very difficult to sex a hyena. Hi, Raphael, and good afternoon to you. Raphael wanting to know how old the cub actually is. Um, so it's nice and fluffy, and it's, it's actually, it does have its spots. So they're, they're actually born black, and they're usually quite small, little black creatures like this. They're so cute. And they start gaining their spots when they're about four months old. So this one's got quite a lot of spots, as you can see. Uh, and it's started to go a bit lighter around the neck. So I would say it's probably around the six, seven, eighth month old uh, area. So still very much reliant on mum's milk. They only really get weaned or start getting weaned uh, after a year, can be up to 18 months. So it's quite a long time that they will actually suck, suckle milk from the mother. Very rarely will hyenas bring anything back meat-wise to the den. So this little one will actually stay around the den. It won't join mum until it's over a year old out on the scavenging missions. So it's going to be keeping nice and safe close to those holes. So this is an old termite mound. Originally Aardvark would most likely have made those holes because they are the excavators of the bush. They've got huge claws and they can build these holes. They can actually dig 
something like a metre in 10 minutes. They are just absolutely amazing animals and they can dig six metres down to make themselves a bed chamber and then they dig holes into termite mounds to get at the termites. So once the termites have uh, been extinguished from that mound then other animals can actually take over those holes and that's why you get the hyenas using the termite mounds and the holes. So they, they're going to be having quite a nice cool area in that hole but also the, the cubs will actually make a little area sort of scrape it away so only they can fit in there so if there are any predators around they can actually retreat back into the right at the back of that hole and hopefully keep nice and safe from predators while mum is away. So did we have anybody coming back with the whistle? Orange in the door. Sorry, I think I preempted your question there <laughs> about hyenas making the holes themselves. So not really. They've actually they don't have um, very long claws. Really, they are claws like dogs, and that's one of the reasons why they got placed in the dog suborder because they do look like a dog, and especially with the claws. Um, a lot of the members of the cat order are able to retract their claws, especially the true cats, or at least have nice sharp claws, but not the hyena. But it's all to do with uh, differences in the skull between the dogs and the cats. I wonder if that Franklin's making its way around and that's possibly what the little hyena is hearing. <laughs> Ah, Mansoup. There is a chin spot bat is calling, but that wasn't the bird. So I'm wondering if it was just a little bit too far. But chin spot bat is says three blind mice. <whistles> chin spot batis. So do listen out for that one as well. But this one was more like a whistle, like a Let's see if I can actually do it. No, that was rubbish. <laughs> so it was actually a grey hornbill, sounding like an admiral's whistle. So I think we're going to head to Byron. I think he's actually found something. <laughs> so good luck, enjoy, and I think it's a mammal this time. <laughs> it is indeed Tara, um, a beautiful big male giraffe who is now moving away from us. <laughs> we're actually down in a drainage line and we look, we're looking up at him, but uh, he's now moving off to, through the thicket. Well, thank goodness you got a brief view of a giraffe with us. So we found something. We have found a mammal so far. It's a bit better than this morning. <laughs> a better start. Fortunately, he's not interested in hanging around. Now, how am I going to get out of this drainage line? I'm going to try reverse here quickly. Um, I'll just get back out. Senzo, let me know when I hit something. Jinlin, you asked, is it a cat day? And you asked who is roaming the neighborhood that we should look out for. Well, this morning we had tracks of the, a mating pair of leopards. They were around yesterday morning. We didn't get to see them, though, um, because we weren't out and the Mara show was on. But then yesterday afternoon, no one could find them. And last night we heard them right outside camp. They were very close to camp. They walk, walked and drank at... Um, at uh, uh, Gauri Dam, the, or Voyatella Dam, 
Uh, we found tracks of them this morning, but we couldn't found, find them. They crossed into Arethusa, unfortunately. No lions were found this morning, so we, we don't know. I, Jinlin, I'm going to try and see. Maybe we find some leopard tracks a little bit later. That would be great. But uh, for the moment, for as we know, there were no cats on Juma this morning. But it does change and they do move around and especially during the day in winter the cats do move around a lot more than usual so maybe we're lucky and lions or leopards arrived sometime during the day so we'll see and keep a lookout for fresh tracks Boyzilla, you asked if most animals have a routine that they follow. No, not necessarily. I don't, I don't think so at all. I think the animals will go and drink when they are thirsty, not necessarily at specific times of the day. Um, I think predators will hunt when they are hungry, not necessarily at specific times of the day. Uh, I don't think there's a routine at all. Not at all. If it was, it would probably be a lot easier to find these animals, but it's not. So, no, I don't think there is a routine. I think the only certainty out here is that um, at the moment our drives are from 3 in the afternoon to 6 in the afternoon and the mornings from uh, 6 in the morning to nine in the morning that's the only certainty <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to scan these drainage lines a little bit. Maybe we find a herd of elephant moving through the area. That would be great. Let's head back to Tara with those hyena at the den. <laughs> it is so true, Byron. The only certainty is the drive going out. Because <laughs> it is live. We have absolutely no idea what is going to happen. Now we were hoping to find the hyena snoozing. Some days you can come here and there's no movement and some days you can hit it lucky like we have done now. So there's mum. So you can see she is fairly light in colour but she still has quite a bit of fur on her. And so sometimes they almost look bold once they're very old. orange in the door. Another question from you which is great to hear asking how big the hyena packs can get. Now, it depends on the area that you work in and this is one of the things that I absolutely love about Safari Live is that we have a lot of different guides who have guided all over the different reserves and across the country in different countries as well because what can be true for one animal in one area can be completely different for the same animal in a different area because there's different things that are actually influencing them. So whether it's the weather, the seasons, the vegetation, so the different animals that might be there. Uh, some individuals can obviously be different and have different uh, characteristics. Uh, so there's a lot of things that can change uh, from one area to a next so that's really important um, you know sort of answering these type of questions and that's why it's really good to hear other people's uh, stories and experiences because the, the books that are out there were written usually by one or two people and that's, that's their experience 
as I say, it's not necessarily taking into consideration what happens elsewhere. So a lot of us have obviously guided here in the sands, and then some of us have actually guided in smaller reserves, larger reserves, and that is going to have that impact. So here in the Sabi Sands, we don't tend to see the clans that big. Um, we've, I think the largest clan uh, number that I, I know of here in the Sands, and maybe Byron can actually correct me, because I know he's done uh, some, some time here in the Sands in the southern side. Uh, so they could even be slightly different there, but certainly around this area I've not seen more than sort of 10 adults or so, maybe 15 in the clan, something like that. In the Mara I believe they do actually have much larger clans, I think they could get up to 60. Um, but again, the, the, the Mara does actually have the numbers of animals to support the clan size. Now here, uh, there's, there is a lot of animals but not to the extent of the Mara. So the clan size, it's not going to be able to support that, that sort of size. So that's why it's going to be quite small still. So it'd be interesting to hear how many Byron's actually seen. Uh, so I wonder if we can bounce that over to him as well. But uh, as I say here, I remember there being a floppy ear. Some viewers might actually remember her. And she, we believe she was actually uh, the matriarch, uh, the high ranking female, but uh, I'm not sure what's going on with the clan members now. I believe this is like a mid-ranking female. So I'm sure the guys would have seen the interactions and that's how you can tell where they are in the rank is the interactions with other hyenas, if they're submissive or if they're the dominant ones, if other hyenas come up to them and sniff them. Uh, if they are the dominant, then, as I say, the others come up to sniff. If they're submissive, they go to the higher ranking to smell them. So I think Byron has maybe got something in his sights. I'm hoping for you. <laughs> I was trying to have a look, everyone. Now, um, often you get these little bird parties where a bird party is basically a number of little birds fly in in a group and they'll go and look for food and, um, and, and move together. Now, a southern black tit is a um, is a great indication of a bird party they'll always be in or with uh, with a number of other birds now this is a beautiful beautiful uh, a knob thorn that, that that the birds are actually flying in at the moment there's a lot of birds around here um and let's see what that is on the left there Senza. that is the southern black tit the two of them there they are uh, black and, and white on the wings, but there are a number of birds, and with all these flowers around at the moment, a lot of birds looking for food um, in there. But look at that beautiful yellow flowers. A as I was saying, it's hard to see all the birds around there, but I we saw black headed oriole, um, a bar throated apelus. Taylor. Hello, Taylor. Taylor's watching, and she's on leave. Um, Taylor said she's missing all the animals already. Well, Taylor, so am I, because I haven't been able to find anything. <laughs> well, this morning, there we go. What have we got jumping around there? That looks like um, uh, what a, a long-billed crumb. No, not that one. The other one. At the, that is the bar-throated apelus, everyone. That little one that is jumping and f moving around there. Let's just see if we can see it. Uh, we just need some light on the front. You'll see very yellow and a black bar, very clear black bar across the chest. Uh, there we go. Come on, out into the open for us. And you can just see the yellow. Look this way, come on. <laughs> Hold on, Senzo, it's very difficult to keep up with these little birds. And keep jumping around. Come on, one more. We just need him to jump out into the open. It's hiding behind the branches a little bit there. There it is. There it is. Mariti. Let me try. Let's just see if we can get another view of it. Oh, 
I'm actually just trying to have a look. You know what? That might have been might have been the yellow uh, yellow breasted apalis that was jumping around there. Riti, you were asking what they they feed on. So um, mainly insects, little insects. Um, sometimes f um, fruit and nectar. I just wish we can see it again. Yeah, it's jumping around. But as you saw, it's so difficult to get a good view of them while they're jumping around in these thick trees. They're tiny, tiny little birds. What I'll do is let me show you a photo quickly so you know what we're looking for. It's nice to see these little birds. So the bath throat to the palis or apalis is quite common in this area. Yeah, so it was definitely not the bath throated. Um, you can see. Um, can you see that clearly? So this is very light in coloration, but with that black prominent bar, as I said, I think it might be the yellow. Hang on a second, I'll just find it for you. Yellow-breasted, that's it. Yellow-breasted apalis, or a palis, depending on how you want to say it. And that's what we saw. You could see a bit of the yellow jumping around, and then that very prominent black bar down the front. So yellow-breasted apalis, or a palis. It's a nice little one to see. Uh, Sammy, you asked how many kinds of birds live in Africa. Now, I'm not too sure of the total number in Africa. I know southern Africa, however. Southern Africa is just over 900 species. I think it's, I think it's 924 or something like that. I lie, 968. 968 species uh, recorded in southern Africa. That's what it is, 968. That's so quite, a, quite a number of bird species. All right, looks like these birds have moved off, and I think I'm going to do the same. But interesting to see, when you are out, um, when you are out on safari, if you're driving around and you see a number of little birds around, and especially that little southern black tit, that black and white one, it's easy to then see that it is a bird party, perhaps. So, chances of seeing a lot of different bird species together. Oh, some impala running across the road in front of us. And it's nice to, to stop and have a look around and see how many different bird species you can see. Uh, uh, yes, now Tara was chatting about the hyena clans and I don't know what the largest is in this area. I haven't seen enough hyena um, around here. I don't know. The largest clan I've seen has probably in about, been, I think, 10 or 12 hyena. But uh, speaking of the hyena, let's head back to Tara find out how those hyena are doing at the den. Awesome, thanks Byron. So yeah, around the 10, 12 mark, the biggest one that he's seen here for the clan size. So yeah, that seems to be maybe around the sands then. As I say, it is, it's dependent on so many different things. So it would actually be interesting to hear uh, James's views when he joins us as well. Dear Watcher, hello again. Welcome on board this afternoon, asking if there are other any hy- uh, there. <laughs> I'll try that one again, if there are any other hyenas. So these are the spotted hyenas, so-called because obviously the spots on the coat. But there are brown hyenas, which are about a similar size actually, and they have long brown fur. And they are a lot more solitary. Um, they also have a very different call to the spotty hyenas. So uh, the Lion King was very spot on when they had the giggles of the hyenas. Uh, when they get excited, they do have a very high-pitched giggle. And you can also hear them contact calling, which is what I was hearing a couple of nights ago outside my room. And they, they do have a little nosy around camp as well. I did have a female come into camp, knocking over the bin, waking us up. So I had to go out and chase her off. But uh, you tend to have uh, the spotted hyenas 
uh, sort of hunting together as a, as a pack sometimes. Sometimes they go off and forage by themselves. That's more the norm here in, in the Sabi Sands. But as I say, they are a very good hunter in their own right. But the brown hyena tends to be more solitary. Um, there's not been a whole lot of research done on the brown hyena, but I think there has been some more come through fairly in the fairly recent years. So I think they can still uh, den together, but they will still go off uh, and forage alone. I've been lucky enough to have a few brown hyena sightings, and there was one actually on the old reserve I used to work at, and we stopped for drinks, and there was a bunch of wildebeest in the distance, and two sort of separated themselves, and it was just it was just becoming dusk, and I suddenly realised, hold on a minute, that's not too wildebeest, they're a little bit too small, and the back is sloping even more so than that of the wildebeest. And I actually realised it was two brown hyenas walking, so they must have been mating, uh, which would have been really amazing to see, but unfortunately they're very secretive. They're, they're probably even more secretive than the leopard, actually, so if you get to see a brown hyena, uh, unless you're in the very special places like the Kalahari and I think uh, Taylor was saying that she's seen quite a number of brown hyenas and uh, I believe Taylor's actually on board this afternoon <laughs> missing the animals already. Hi Taylor! <laughs> and I know the brown hyena was something that she really wanted to see here in the sands. We've had one sighting a long time ago by Peter Pretorius, some of you might remember joining him for that drive and they actually have quite a strong pungent smell and that's one of the smells for some reason I can pick up on very easily so I'm forever keeping a smell out for you guys. <laughs> There's also the striped hyena which is a little bit smaller than the spotted and the brown a uh, nice silvery colour with black stripes they tend to be found further north uh, of the co in the, the, Ochi, the whole continent so more so centralised but also quite a beautiful hyena. Hi, David, asking if clan takeovers are common amongst hyenas. Um, I, I'm kind of taking it as if a female will try and take over another clan. I'm kind of taking it as that, but not really. Um, you tend to, again, the clan members are going to be related, so it's going to be the mother and the offspring, uh, the aunts, the daughters, that sort of thing. Uh, the males will tend to be uh, pushed out, they tend to be a little bit more solitary uh, once they leave the clan after about two years of age, although the high-ranking uh, female cubs, uh, sorry, the, the cubs from the high-ranking female, can tend to stay for a little bit longer, maybe until they're about three. And it's possible that gives them the edge when they're trying to approach other clans. They actually are a little bit bolder because uh, unfortunately male hyenas have a bit of a hard time because the females have so much testosterone in their body. They're actually a lot larger than the males generally. Um, so they ha have quite a lot of aggression as well so a male has to approach a female very cautiously so if he gets on the wrong side of her believe me those jaws are extremely powerful I think they've actually been measured at like 1500 psi or pounds per square inch so they're actually one of the uh, strongest bites of the mammal kingdom they really are quite astonishingly strong so if they get on the wrong side of the female they hold no punches they will tell that male she is definitely not interested. So they almost have to go through this ritual of sort of bowing to her and then creeping forward, then bowing again. So it can be quite intimidating. So if the males have actually uh, built up their courage, and especially, as I say, if they're from a high-ranking female, they've built up that courage, they tend to be a little bit bolder and it's more likely they get the matings as well because they do have that edge. But uh, in terms of clan takeover, uh, if, if the high-ranking ra female dies, then it's going to be the next high-ranking female that takes over, really. And uh, again, that's, that's generally already established uh, because of the ranks and uh, all the rituals of coming up and uh, showing dominance and 
some submissive behavior. And lovely Luri, welcome on board this afternoon. Lovely Luri wanting to know if males actually make coalitions or group of males. So obviously with uh, the lions and the cheetahs, uh, hopefully you've heard that term before, the coalition, and that's just the, the brothers basically banding together. It's generally related males. Um, in terms of hyenas, I don't, I've not really heard of males doing that. Um, I'm just, I'm wondering if maybe to hunt, I wonder if that happens in the Mara. Uh, I say with the larger clan sizes there, but I'm just, I'm not really remembering that males do here. I might have to do a little bit of digging just to remind myself about that, but at this stage I'm saying I'm pretty sure they don't. Um, again, because there's a lot of competition uh, between individuals, but I'm, I'm willing to be corrected on that one. If anybody wants to check up for us, just to remind me, then please do so. Hashtag Safari Live, but I'm pretty sure they don't. So I think um, we, oh, we've got another question coming through. Oh, new viewer, Lion. Welcome on board this afternoon. I hope you're enjoying your first live safari. And Lion wanting to know, are hyenas dangerous to humans? Well, they can be. And this, again, anything in the bush has the ability to be dangerous to humans if you lose the respect for the bush. And hyenas are no exception. If you turn your back on a hyena at night, a hyena can actually do some damage. And there's been the odd story where people have left their doors open to their rooms at night and the hyenas have actually come in and taken them off their bed and dragged them away and killed them. So you do have to treat these animals with respect. But again, uh, as I say, I chased one out of the camp the other day or the other night. Um, I was still close to my room so I wasn't uh, making any silly moves, but I had to tell her, you know what, this is my territory, get out. <laughs> and again, there's that respect there. She, she knew she was in the wrong and she ran out of it. To their siesta, because as I said before, siesta, siesta is over. So we're going to carry on our, our search for other animals, um, see what Byron has got for you while we do that. Oh, nothing just yet. There's a bird soaring above us. Let's see if we can try to get on camera and see what it is. Oh, no. It's far. Do you see it, Senza? But it is a bit far for us in the center of the screen. I, I think it's even too far for the camera, maybe. What do you think, Senza? Looks like a Marshall Eagle. I think it's a Marshall Eagle, everybody. I caught a glimpse of white underneath and sheesh, that is far. It's disappeared into the sky. <laughs> uh, oh well, but I do think it was a Marshall Eagle soaring above us. I just caught a glimpse of white with that brown. I, maybe I'm just trying to convince myself, but I do think it was a Marshall Eagle, but just too far, unfortunately. I'm going to head down towards Chitwa Dam. Hopefully we have some activity there of animals coming down to drink or animals in the area, some elephant, anything. Because for the moment, I haven't seen too much. At least. Ah, oh, let's try here. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Ah, oh, no, it can't be. There's a better leer flying there, and a vulture. Which one are you focusing on first? Since let's have a look. That is a vulture.
looked like a white backed vulture. Amazing to see them soaring above us like that. Oh, there's some vultures. There was a batelier above us too, but they're flying incredibly high today. I'm assuming the thermals are giving them a, a hand, them soaring above us like that. It's actually nice to see birds of prey flying around. But it's just unfortunately they're so far, it's very difficult to get them on camera. James, not at all. Um, I have not seen any buds on any of the trees. Um, the only thing showing signs of life really are, is the um, is the acacia nigrescens, the knobthorn. The knobthorn's the only tree that is showing signs of life with those beautiful yellow flowers at the moment. The rest of the trees, I haven't seen any new buds or anything just yet. I, th I think we need to wait a few more weeks before we start seeing anything. Uh, Chitty Chatty Meg, you say it's hard to believe that those were actually flowers on the knob thorn. Of course they were, Meg. What else would they be? They were. They um, beautiful yellow flowers that you see on the on those knob thorns this time of year. And every now and then you can pick up that sweet smell of those flowers. Very very sweet smell. I love flowers. <laughs> I must be honest, that's one thing that becomes difficult in summer, is identifying all the little flowers around. It's not easy. And I often forget I need to go back and refresh and try and remember all the names again of the different flowers. Ah, now we had some birds flying above us. It sounds like Tara has another bird that she'd like to show you. She said literally just as they're going to link to us, it's going to fly, and it did. But I'm just going to pull back because I can still see him. But because I, oh, there we go, stay. Come on, this is your five seconds of fame. Yes, you, I'm talking to you. Um, okay, so just up, yeah, just up, you've got him in the shot, just a bit higher up. Uh, yeah, there you go. There we go. So this was the bird who was whistling like an admiral. A little bit earlier, the grey hornbill. That shock of yellow on the bill, other than that, completely grey. Now, the technical term for the hornbills, they're, they're split off into two groups. We've got the head up whistlers and the head down cluckers. Believe me, that is actually a technical term. Amazing, isn't it? So the head up whistlers are the grey hornbills because when they whistle they put the head back and then they whistle and as you might expect the head down cluckers which include the southern red billed and the southern yellow billed hornbills put the heads down and they cluck. It really is true. So next time you hear the hornbills they kind of go 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 back 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 and they doing this with the wings and they're down like this. It's really cool to watch. I'll see if I can find it for you. <laughs> but yes, nice to see the grey hornbills. So apparently someone has spotted some buffalo at the pan just over the way here. So we're going to see if we can catch up with them because I know you guys haven't seen buffalo for a wee while. So it'd be nice to catch up with the old boys. I'm sure it will be a small herd of Dugger boys or even just one Dugger boy. 
So we'll see if anybody is still with them. Is there any station with Inyati at Galago Waterhall? Sorry, Pan. Through there, there's a jackal. I thought I saw movement. It just disappeared through the bush. Let me just see if I can see him again. Sidestripe jackal, how about that? I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it. I think he might have just disappeared into the thick bush. Some, literally just something caught my attention there, the corner of my eye. That's after me saying I've only seen Jackal once on the but I'm afraid I think he has just disappeared through the bush. Maybe he'll come out towards the watering hole. Maybe. Oh, lacquer. Oh, you're in for a treat. <laughs> well done, Byron. I'm going to wait for him to show you what he's got. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at this. Yes, our plan has worked out an elephant and he's actually been swimming. You can see he's completely wet. He's been splashing around in the water down here at Chitwa Dam. Oh, this is wonderful. Really wonderful. I'm hoping he goes back into the water. Let's have a look. Oh, this is always a very, very pleasant surprise if we do get elephant down at the dam for some reason they really enjoy they really enjoy coming down to swim and splash around in the water it's just a lone bull I don't see any others around it's not unusual to find a bull by himself sometimes you find the bulls in small groups two three four of them moving around especially the younger bulls watch there he goes Yes, yes. <laughs> Look at that, he's completely on his side. <laughs> this is my favorite, everyone. I promise you, I, I can watch this for hours. And he seems to be having a lot of fun. how beautiful and th those white tusks are in contrast to the body now the body's very dark gray because he is so wet <laughs> oh yes wow look at that <laughs> we've got a breaching elephant everyone that's what's going on here a breaching elephant Seek truth, you say a dunking elephant. Look how, much, how that elephant's enjoying that water. That is wonderful. As I said, look at the contrast, those beautiful tusks against that dark skin. The light is perfect now. What words would you use? You don't really have to use words in sightings like this. It's just nice to sit and appreciate and and watch. I mean... This is special. This is one of my favorite things to see out in the bush when these elephants play and splash around in the water. <laughs> Kim, good afternoon to you. You're a new viewer apparently and you say it's almost like this elephant is performing just for us. It, it almost looks that way, doesn't it? <laughs> it just looks like he's having so much fun. Every now and then he goes and he tries to get a bit of food on the bank and then jumps back into the water.
Kermi, you asked if elephants ever get water in their ears. I don't know. I'm possibly. I've never seen an elephant get out of the water though and jump on the side on one leg or two legs to get the water out their ears. <laughs> so I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. I doubt it. Let's have a look. This fish eagle just took off from the dam. I wonder. Look, there it goes. That beautiful African fish eagle. Well done, Senzo. Let, oh. Oh, he's probably going to some trees to the back there. We may get another view of him later. Uh, I see where he landed. We'll carry on watching our elephant for a while though, I think. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Now in other parts of southern Africa, especially up in Botswana and Zambia, the the um, elephants need to cross big rivers, deep rivers. So they're very used to swimming and they do enjoy it. And I often see, I've seen elephants, herds of elephants, move through or cross a river. And just their trunks sticking out of the water. And an entire herd, even the youngsters. There's quite a breeze coming off of this dam at the moment. Very cool, cool breeze. Oh, has he had enough? Is he going to move off? Chitty chatty Meg, you say that was just too cute. Yeah, it was indeed. Meg, I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> he's, he's definitely <laughs> he's behaving quite or well, in quite a boisterous manner this elephant I wonder if he isn't in a bit of must obviously we can't see now because he's completely wet so we can't see if he's sweating from, from his possibly in must I'm not sure as I said we can't tell now because he's completely wet look at that, that. Elephant swagger when they walk downhill. <laughs> I enjoy seeing that. <laughs> All right, now I think uh, we're going to leave this elephant and his wonderful swagger. And let's head across to somebody who also has a bit of a swagger, my friend James in the Mara. Good morning, everybody. No, that's a ridiculous thing to say. Good afternoon. Hello. Welcome to the Sunday Sunset Safari from the Masai Mara. My name is James Hendry. Fergus is on camera. Grubby hand that has been a dusty day. Dusty day it has. We're in amongst the wildebeest here. We are as live as Byron, of course. Uh, some might say more alive than Byron. And uh, hashtag Safari Live is how you get hold of us. Now, you may notice from the flapping of my hat that there's quite a lot of wind at the moment. And that's because over there there's a large storm. And there it is. Uh, I think it's moving up the escarpment, so I think we'll be all right. We are getting the odd spattering of rain. But what we have around us, of course, is a huge number of wildebeest. In the tree over there, we've got some vultures. And down in the valley, where there is no signal, there are some lions. And those lions are not far from here, and they seem to be heading up in this way. We can't really go any further down from where we are now. So what I will attempt to do is show you where they are from here. Well, that won't be hard because there are two vehicles there. But I'm going to pick up my binoculars. And let's look down there together. And we'll see if we can't... I saw one of them get up and move towards this area here. And they keep making sort of gentle movements in this direction. Uh, 
Rita, you want to know how many wildebeest I think there are here approximately? I would hesitate to guess, but I'd say uh, four or five thousand maybe. It's, you know, I don't know. I, I think it would be very interesting to put me into this area, get an answer out of me, and then do the same with Brent, and the same with Scott, and the same with Jamie, and see, the, without us knowing what each other had said, and then get some kind of an indication, because I think you'll find that it would be very different for every one of us. I don't know. I would say about, oh, a few thousand, yes. Now, that shot that you have there is what we call a slightly compressed shot, in that the lioness is not quite as close to the wildebeest as she looks there. And we use that technique sometimes when we're on bushwalk, and then you come to us, and suddenly it looks like we're standing underneath an elephant. It's a sort of trick of the trade, if you like. And so, although I have almost no doubt that those lions who don't look very fat are thinking about hunting these wildebeest, I'm not sure, obviously, when they're going to do that. We've seen Brent in this area a few times with lions watching them on the hunt, and they have been startlingly impatient about it. Some might say uh, to the point of incompetence, sort of just running into the middle of them and seeing what they could find, and seeing if they couldn't catch one that tripped over its own feet. And we've yet to see these chaps be successful. But we might be lucky here. I think it's definitely going to be worth us sitting here and waiting to find out if these lions aren't going to come up here and hunt one of these wildebeest. So in case you're wondering, I'm just going to tell you our plan out here in the Mara for the duration of the time that the wildebeest and Thompson's gazelles, of course, and zebra are here is going to be to try and find them and the predators that are hunting them and see if we can't, well, first of all, make some sort of prediction about what's going to happen and then watch the hunts, failed or otherwise. Most of them will inevitably be failures and, of course, many of us, myself included, uh, don't mind the failed hunts. They're good fun to watch and it's always quite nice to end your day without death. But some of them will be inevitably successful. And so while the... Hi everybody, it sounds like you've had some wonderful views from the Mara with a herd of wildebeest and some lions sitting behind them. That sounds like something might happen there, something exciting. So I'm sure James is going to keep us updated on what's happening there. The wonders of technology, hey? From the Mara up in Kenya, back down here to South Africa in the blink of an eye. Absolutely fantastic. So we are, oh, we have two Nyala bulls and one of them displaying. Oh, that is one of the best things to see. Look at that. Now I'm saying one of them's displaying. Can you see the male at the back? He's got the silver mane erect. He's being very deliberate at where he's placing his feet. And the other male is not even but oh that's why there is another male there's a third male it's going to say this younger male in front is kind of saying no you're, you're the winner but there is the rival so they are slowly dancing around each other they're sizing each other up trying to work out who is going to be the winner they're going to do everything they can to avoid a direct confrontation because if they get injured during that confrontation I'm going to move a bit further along the wall because we're going to lose them behind the bush there the dance of dominance very much so I think we might be better there should be a nice view there's actually a fourth male there that is amazing Maybe we were better back there. I thought we were going to see them through there. But 
definitely coined a phrase there, dance of dominance. So I, I'm wondering if he has decided that maybe he's not going to be the winner. He has stopped his dance, so there we go, he's starting again. So animals go through these rituals because, as I say, if they actually have a direct fight, those horns could potentially spear the rival male, and if, if there is the loser that does get injured, that could actually impact on their ability to run away from predators. It could actually uh, reduce their ability to find food if, it's, if they're really badly injured. So they go through this ritual to work out who is likely to win, who is the largest, who is the strongest, by showing off everything they have. So by standing with their fur erect, it makes them larger, and you can see them arching their back as well. Hi Zoe, welcome on board this afternoon. And Zoe wanting to know, is it mating season or do they do this throughout the year? So generally speaking, in the Arlas, there's the other male coming into view again. So generally speaking, uh, so the spiral-horned antelope and the Nyala don't have a very strict uh, mating season, although <coughs> when the young are born, they will often drop when it's... Uh, sorry. <coughs> <coughs> I think I swallowed a bug. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, so yes, they uh, will often drop their young during the, the rainy season when there's plenty of food. But there might be a female that's actually an estrus not too far from here, and that's triggered these males to come together and uh, fight for her, or fight for the right to mate with her. But I, th I think the male behind, I think he's the winner because the other, the male that's in front of the shot, he seems to have uh, remained stationary for a little while. The hair's gone down on his back. So I think he's kind of realised that perhaps he is not the best male. Oh, and it sounds like that solitary male elephant has found a few friends. So I'm going to see if they do carry on. Uh, there's actually another, there's a fifth male Nyala around here, so I'm wondering if there is a female around that's uh, caused them to all gather here. He's just here on the right here. <laughs> but nowhere near as magnificent with the horns as the other two males who were displaying just now. But I think that bull has found some friends, so I think it's worth definitely checking them out. Well, it is indeed. Now, I think the bull moved off, but look at this wonderful herd. I think there are about 22 elephant that have just arrived to drink. I'm not sure if they're going to feel comfortable enough to go in, get in and swim. Oh, there we go, there we go. There's already one or two of them wading in. But I'm assuming, I'm hoping the whole herd comes and spreads out. They all seem to be keen for a drink. I think this big female, on the right in the front on the left hand side, I think that is the matriarch. She's one of the largest elephant. Um, sorry, I beg your pardon, not that one. Just to the, the right, um, sorry Senzo, there, just behind her, that one there, yes. I think that is the matriarch. She's the largest female that I can see in the group. And also she led the herd down to the water. She walked in front and she kind of surveyed the area to make sure it was safe. Just listen to the sounds. I'm going to keep quiet for a second. Listen to them sipping or slurping up the water in their trunk, sucking up the water and drinking.
<laughs> Splashing the water around, isn't that wonderful? See again, in situations like this, the side <laughs> <laughs> Looks like this elephant's just playing, spraying the water. Now we've positioned that. Uh, so when I saw the herd coming down, I actually moved away from. We were on the dam wall. Saw them coming and moved away um, because I could see the the female, the, the large female, was smelling. So I didn't want to make her nervous. She can obviously see something is blocking away. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Little youngster. Staying very close to the herd. Oh, that is cute. So as I was saying, it looked like the, the herd. Oh, listen to the communication going on between the herd. coming I can see in the background and um, and she then eventually led the whole herd across the dam wall and came out to drink on this side and drinking this side before so I assumed they would come here and um, and also I, I've positioned a little bit further away the wind is in our favor it's blowing it's not blowing directly to them and often if our scent is blowing directly to them they do get a bit nervous so we're actually in a perfect spot right now. Ah, wonderful. But you see how those large females are very protective over that youngster. It stays close to them, stays in between the herd. A lot of the time they'll stop and they'll just basically listen and see if they can smell us they want to make sure we're not a threat or we aren't a danger for the younger elephant and while the herd is drinking now there are looks like two swimming at the moment just behind the herd isn't this a magnificent scene though And we just sat here patiently and waited for them. And I've said this before. Uh, give give the animals their space and often they'll relax. And then either you can move a bit closer or they'll mo move closer to you. It's again that mutual respect. And especially having respect for the animals. Not making them feel in any way that they are in danger. I mean, look at those elephants swimming back there now. Now, it's interesting if we just have a look at these little elephants off to the left here. Now, look at that little one. Now, it takes an elephant, a young elephant, about mm, two years before they really know how to use their trunks and so you can see often what they'll do is the young ones will, f will watch the females and these this is a learning curve for them they'll still be suckling completely from the mother they'll be drinking milk but they will start learning to drink water and it's interesting to see how they're trying to use their trunks to put the water in their mouth and they will learn that from watching the adults. Alright, let's quickly head across to Taro with the slender mongoose and we'll wait and see what these elephants get up to. Welcome back everybody. So we were just going to turn around because we can hear some elephants actually 
behind a gallery down wall. We saw a slender mongoose making its way over to the two mounds that are on your screen now. And it actually popped its head up from behind the back mound. So I was hoping maybe we might catch a glimpse of it, but I think he's uh, playing hide and seek. But it's a, set, it's a mongoose that's quite solitary. So we see the dwarf mongoose quite a lot, but we don't get really get a chance to see the slender because they're just so quick. And they're quite shy as well, so they tend to just stick to the undergrowth. But they are a mongoose that are diurnal, they, they're active during the day. Uh, they'll also prey uh, on the dwarf mongoose, so they are a predator of the, the dwarf mongoose. And unfortunately I think he is a bit camera shy, sadly. <laughs> Hi Rick, and um, welcome on board. Uh, asking if the mongoose are part of the same family as ferrets. Now I'm really going to have to dig deep for this. I remembered it just like that years and years and years ago. Uh, but I do, I'm do. i pretty sure the ferrets are actually part of uh, the mustelids, which are part of the dog order. But I am going to have to double check that one for you because that's like... Sure, I haven't used that bit of information from about seven, eight years ago, so I will double check that one for you and uh, I'll, I shall do that while you head across back to Byron and we'll see if this little guy pops out, otherwise we'll head on down to see if we can find the elephants just at the back of the dam as well. Oh, look, uh, it looks like more of these elephants have decided to swim and play, even some of the younger ones, all getting involved and having a bit of fun in the water. <laughs> this is just, this is my absolute favourite, I must be honest. If I Now, I counted 22 initially, but uh, about five more have joined. See, these ones a little bit nervous. They were further behind the herd. Unless they're just excited, they can see everyone else is swimming. They might decide to go and get in the water too. Just catch up to the herd a little bit. Oh, there's a youngster. It's incredible. They were making a lot of noise and as soon as they got out the water it was quiet. And hear some of the water thickness calling, that high-pitched whistle that we just heard. A lot of birds around, starlings, three-banded plovers, Egyptian geese, that fish eagle that we saw earlier that moved off. And I think it just perched itself in, in another tree. And still some more elephant joining, another one or two. A wonderful herd. Yana, there's no set number of how many elephants will be in a herd. It can range from three elephant up to 150 or 300 elephant in some areas. It all depends. The most elephant I've seen in the Sabi Sands, probably between 80, 80 and 100 elephant in one group, one herd. Occasionally what can happen too is that group or that herd will split, possibly two different herds three, four different herds that have met up in an area and they split up again. So it can vary and it can change. Um, the most elephant I've seen I think is in Botswana in one herd. About 150 elephant together. 
but wasn't that perfect timing to get down to the dam and see this interaction. Tina, you asked, or you said, with so much room, why do they bunch up so close together? Well, the thing is, Tina, I would, I would say, and I mean, this is my theory, I don't know, but uh, elephant herds, there's a very close-knit family unit, and they rely a lot on each other for safety. Now, when they do come down to swim, um, or drink, rather, the the elephants are still cautious, even though they are big and powerful and these herds probably don't have any predators out here. But they are still very cautious and they look after the young, they look after each other. And because they're also so social, the swimming behavior that we witnessed is very social behavior. It's a bit of fun and it's nice to see the herd moving around together and I think that's why they stay close together is just for safety for a bit of fun establishing those bonds between the herd Is the last one so as I was saying our timing is perfect to see them moving through and swimming that was just fantastic absolutely fantastic I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did let's head it back to oh, let's head it back <laughs> let's head back to Tara and see if she's still got those in Yala and if they are still doing their wonderful dancing display. Oh, hello everybody. We do still have the Niala. They are still down there. So we've um, been backwards and forwards across the dam wall a couple of times because we have heard the elephants in the background there. So we're just trying to work out the best part uh, to try and see them. And I think they're actually heading towards the western side of the drainage line. But it looks like there's a couple of very big bulls there. So there is the Nyala. Oh, no, another go at trying to display there. Can you see he was really arching his back? And even the tail joins in as well and gets curled around. And he's definitely much larger than the male on the left, who he's just uh, forced back. But interestingly enough, all the female Nyala are on the northern side of the dam. So <laughs> they're all over there. They're right off in the distance there. I think there's some impala that's joined them as well. Those are impala. So the Nyala were, I think, They've headed more to the right. There's actually a couple of dead trees a bit further right, somewhere around there. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yep. Yeah. So I was just seeing if there was another vehicle that wanted to cross the wall. I have just seen the elephants just moving that way, so I think we're going to drive around and just see if we can catch up with them. So... Hi, antelope! That's why uh, I just missed the question. <laughs> antelope asking about antelope slightly confused me then welcome on board uh, wanting to know if antelope other antelope species use dance as a way of intimidating other males and it's not really spring to mind like the dance that the Niala do but they certainly will size each other up and sort of side by side. And a lot of animals actually do that, even the cats. So, 
hope if this male impala was actually showing, he was throwing his head back and actually grunting then, so he might just do it again, because there's a couple more males here. So he's just showing his dominance. So they don't tend to dance, but they do tend to roar and just strut their stuff. Uh, as I say, just walking side by side helps them to see which one is taller. There you go, you can see them. To see him actually throwing his head back. The elephants are coming up behind us. So I'm going to just try and turn the vehicle around just so we're facing them, so we can see what they get up to. He does look like a big bull. Just trying to work out where he's likely to want to go, because we don't want to be in the way of this bull. <laughs> See where it is. So he's going to come out just in front of us there. There we go. Look at that. I'm wondering if he might just be going down to drink. Hello, mister. Good afternoon to you. And the second one's going to be coming up behind shortly. So there's a second one that's just coming through the bush where the first one came from. Now he's not in must, I'm not smelling anything. Ah, quoted, welcome on board, asking if the bull we've just seen is the bull from Byron's head his time and I think there's a little little herd with him as well but Byron uh, 15 minutes 10 15 minutes maybe just to get down there I mean, it's not too far but it is far enough uh, that, that there's no way that elephant could have got here from there in that time so pretty sure he is a different bull can hear them just starting to come out the bush here so with that bull taking that pathway there I want to make sure that we keep that clear because it's likely that the other elephants are going to want to come through there and obviously we don't want to get in their way so you can just about see the head poking through and I seem to remember this was always a spot that elephants liked Uh, they always like to stop here for a dust bath, so apparently it's really good dust there. And the dust actually just helps to dislodge any uh, parasites that might be on the body. Helps to keep the skin in good condition. And obviously during the summer they will actually put mud all over their bodies as well. And when the mud hardens, then that will fall off and they'll actually scratch against the tree to encourage it to fall off. And that can also pull out ticks and any parasites that are caught amongst all the wrinkles in their skin. Now these look young boys, so maybe they're his entourage. <laughs> uh, as we were saying earlier on today, uh, the young bulls tend to start breaking away from the female herds uh, when they're about 16, 18 years old, and then they go and find older bulls to hang around with, and they learn how to be bulls. 
you learn how to spar and uh, fight as uh, well the same thing spar and fighting but they also learn what to do and the etiquette of being male elephants basically so it looks like they are learning from the big male who passed us now i think that big male was possibly in his late 30s maybe early 40s maybe slightly later maybe mid 40s now that's quite a young a young bull that's trailing behind so there might be some females in here as well it looks like they might go down to drink so i think it's worth us going onto the wall again they've taken a slightly different route. So the big male carried on walking towards the lodge, but these are just going down to the water's edge here, so it might be that we get to see them drinking. Hi, Yaku. Oops. Oh. Yaku wondering how far elephants walk during the day, so I just misjudged. There's a little bit of a, a dip in the road there, and I just misjudged that one, so we were going for a little wee slide there. But Yaku wanting to know how far elephants walk in a day, and again, it depends on the time of year. This time of year, they will walk much further looking for food and water. Yeah, there we go. Then during the summer, now the summer they tend to do small close loops of figure of eights actually, when they in an area looking for food and they get wider and wider as they go further into summer, uh, into winter, sorry. Oh, that's nice. Unfortunately, I'm the wrong way around, but there's some impala sparring just to the left of the elephants, and the elephants are drinking as well. How about that? Now, elephants are quite particular about the water that they drink. They don't like having uh, any mud or grit or anything like that mixed in, so you notice they'll actually skim the surface of the water with the trunk and get the water that's on top. So you can see they're not putting their trunk right in the water. <laughs> sure, those impala rams are also really going for it at the back there. And the other big bull's on his way back to join these three boys. Look at that. So Exquisite X, I think the, the name was, wanting to know how much water an elephant can hold in its trunk. Um, it will de depend on the size of the elephant, of course, but some of the big adults could hold up to 14 litres in the trunk. Now, I wonder if we're going to see a bit of a standoff. Now, these elephants, we definitely saw them all together in the drainage line. But there seems to be a bit of a interesting thing going on here now we, it looks like they're wanting to greet each other the trunks are actually being held as if they were going to put them in each other's mouths there we go there's the younger bull putting his trunk in the older bull's mouth so maybe they didn't quite greet there we go in the drainage line Apparently that's the best part to drink from. <laughs> Again, look at him. He's just got the tip of his trunk in the water, filtering off the slightly cleaner water on the surface. Now, they could drink up to 100 litres in one go. <laughs> Chantel, synchronised drinking. Oh, and we've got another young bull coming in.
Yeah, definitely synchronised drinking. <laughs> so there's a, you, a little bit of a myth that elephants can uh, use their trunk like a straw and drink it straight through, because obviously that is their nose. So they have to hold it in the trunk and then squirt it into the mouth. On average a day, uh, a big bull elephant could take in maybe 200 litres, 300 litres of water. If, then, if there's something wrong, then they will drink obviously a lot more. And if they're drinking up to 400 or 600 litres, that means there is something not quite right with them. There we go, there's the greeting. Is he allowed to put the trunk in the mouth? Oh, just heard a bit of a trumpet. There's some more elephants to our right in the drainage line. Now, I did hear someone found uh, some leopard tracks actually at Spaghetti Junction. <laughs> so, he got moved out by the bull elephant, so the baby's decided, you know what, I'm going to show my power to the impala instead. <laughs> I don't know if you kind of saw that. I was just having a look for... The elephant, see if there's any more movement from us behind. But uh, they have found, yeah, just keep a watch on that bull. He's not happy with the Nyala and the Impala females. So there's a Nyala male just coming into shot there, and the Impala females heading a little bit further around the waterhole. I think that's a good idea, girls. Oh, I'm gr great. F I think it does sound like everyone saw the little little bull. Oh, there we go. Oh, <laughs> that was towards oh, what we got going on there. <laughs> What's their little one? Oh, it's the Nyala bull on the damn wall. Now he's going to be interesting when he's a big bull, <laughs> if he's throwing his weight around now. Oh, here comes the rest of the herd. I was going to say, he's a little bit young to be on his own. Here comes the rest of the herd. That's where his family are. So many species all at once, definitely Catherine. It is getting a bit cooler. Animals do tend to come down to the water holes to drink late afternoon, especially in the summer. But they're all coming down to drink now. So I'm gonna stay on the wall because I'm hoping they're gonna take the same route as the other elephants. <laughs> it's being quite boisterous. <laughs> I'm just hoping that it's, they don't think it's me that's upsetting their little boy. So I'm just going to keep my eye out on them. Uh, like I was saying, I heard them talking about leopard tracks coming up from Spaghetti Junction. And Spaghetti Junction is the next junction down from here. So they may be finding, and they said that the leopard tracks went north, so I thought maybe hearing the trumpeting, oh, there's a little one. Oh, there's lots of little ones. Here we go. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Mum was nudging the uh, little boy who was causing all the commotion there, nudging him down towards the waterhole again. So perhaps the trumpeting was actually more to communicate with the little boy, see where he's gone maybe, rather than them being scared by a leopard. 
but I'll keep my eyes peeled. Perhaps the leopards are making their way up here. That would be nice. So a few people are a bit concerned about the lapwing. So the lapwing is rather just making a lot of noise. They do tend to get a little bit upset, but it is out the way. So you don't need to worry about that. There's the, okay, so we might get a bit of a greeting going on here. The bull's actually greeting the female and checking to see if she's in estrus. I don't know if you saw, there was the, the trunk just going between the legs again and apparently she she looks like she might be an estrus she's the side of her uh the, the gland by her eye is actually weeping so that can be a sign that they're in estrus or it could be a sign they're a bit distressed so they might have bumped into the leopard a bit further down because it doesn't look like um he's responding to her being an estrus and yeah, you can see the lapwing just to the right of the bull. So it's in, it's in between the bull and the, the cow. There it is. Now they shouldn't have eggs this time of year. There we go. There's the greeting between the bull and the female. So, sorry. <laughs> Oh, no, tell a lie, that's another young bull. So that was the bulls, I think, that were with him earlier. So possibly wanting to try a little bit of sparring there. Gerber Waller. Interesting question there. Is there any explanation as to why the tails get raised horizontally? And it's funny actually, there are a number of animals that do it. Rhinos, giraffes, when they are scared, or when they are uh, excited or becoming aggressive, that tail gets raised. And I'm, I'm actually not sure exactly why what causes that and it could be so it is a very much a, a, there's no way it can be misunderstood that it is actually uh, a sign to say something is wrong because uh, to say sometimes these animals use their body language to actually communicate um, elephant eyesight is not very good so that for an elephant I would say Possibly not, and especially with, with the rhino as well. I'd have to do a bit of digging, see if anyone's actually done any research on that as to why the tail gets raised. And say we all know it does, but why it gets raised, that is an interesting one. This is absolutely fantastic. Hi Rushni. Rushni also making the observation that she, uh, she's often seen the elephants running towards the dam as if there's not enough water around for them. And I think it's the excitement. Buffalo do the same as well. I think it is that excitement, possibly wanting to get there before everyone else muddies the water. Because as I say, they can be quite particular about their water. This time of year, there isn't a lot of water around, but these elephants also know where to go digging for it. Again, the spaghetti junction I mentioned, they do have uh, the, the sandy areas where you can find where the elephants have actually been digging. And sometimes you can actually catch them drinking there and they'll, take the, they'll wait their turn. So they'll dig, they'll wait for the water to fill up the hole and drink. And obviously that water is going to be filtered by the sand, so it's going to be nice and clean and they will actually wait their turn. Oh, 
Oh, right. Oh, right. Oh, so there is actually uh, a black blacksmith lapwing nest. So they do still have a nest. Or they did. Apparently one of them, what, uh, the zoomies actually saw that one of the elephants actually stand on the nest. I wasn't sure where the nest might be. So now I'm understanding why uh, people were getting a bit concerned. I thought you were getting concerned for the bird, say, so I know the bird's going to keep well out of the way. But they were trying to keep the elephants from trampling their nest. But unfortunately, this time it didn't work. I was going to say, I've actually seen lapwings dive bomb, and because they weren't really doing that, I thought they were just being fussy about the elephants coming down, because they do tend to get quite vocal. Um, but when they're trying to protect a nest, I have seen them dive bombing the animals, trying to keep them away from the nest, which I didn't see this time. But unfortunately, as I say, possibly because they haven't done it, they've actually lost their nest, sadly. Oh, it could be that this lapwing pair and not as experienced. Maybe they just put their nest in a slightly too much of an open area. And so it'd be interesting to find out if someone has a screenshot and maybe put an arrow on it to show me where that nest might have been. Because unfortunately uh, for the lapwings, they, they don't make a song and dance about where their nest is purely because obviously they don't want to show where their eggs are. And the eggs are extremely well camouflaged as well. Yeah. Oh, oh, we've got the Niala look. <laughs> The elephants are not liking the wildebeest or the niana. I think we need to maybe move. They're not happy about those wildebeest coming in. <laughs> wildebeest have decided, you know what, elephants, it's our time in the drainage line because they are being extremely protective, considering it is wildebeest. But did you see this female right up front making sure the babies are behind her? Absolutely fantastic. So I think we're going to see what Byron's caught up with. And we're going to just reposition ourselves and see if we can get another view for you. Uh, we found some zebra and the zebra is posing beautifully for us. It's a beautiful, beautiful shot. That golden light and the zebra enjoying the termite mound, getting a bit of a view from up there. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Just listening to one of the other guides. I'm giving an update. Um, they trying to look follow up on leopard tracks or trying to track a leopard. They've got some leopard tracks somewhere. Don't think it's on Juma. Uh, just I, I think there are different sets of tracks around at the moment. Um, but he just said to the other guide, he said uh, there's he's been looking around. Looks like the tracks head north, but no joy yet. <laughs> so that obviously means he just hasn't found it yet. <laughs> Here's another zebra. Sticking its head out just to the right of the termite mound. Well, it was, it's now put its head down. So it looks like we've both had a lot of luck with elephant this afternoon. Tara's also had a wonderful sighting of the elephant near the dam. And it sounds like they're covered in mud at the moment. Let's head back there and see what they're up to.
Oh, well, we were going to move on and see if we can get a better view, but then they started rolling in the mud, and it's just so wonderful to see that. So we have one of the females really giving herself a good mud bath. And as I say, even in the winter time, it can actually help remove ticks and other parasites. During the summer, it'll help to keep them cool. <laughs> Are you helping that one down there? <laughs> it's like, go on, get down. <laughs> oh, it's absolutely awesome play for the little ones. They really seem to enjoy having a mud bath. Some of the smaller elephants you can see right in the middle of the herd. Oh, and it looks like the old bull might try to be rolling in mud. I'm not sure if he's really going to do well there, but. First time I've seen this before. <laughs> it's almost like he's actually crouching so they're feeling less intimidated by him. Look at that. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Luke the Duke, I think I totally agree with you. Elephants are so much better than humans. But it really is amazing how much we share with them. It really is. And the more we learn about elephants, the more we realise we didn't know. So I've never actually seen this type of behaviour with an old bull and a younger bull before. This is absolutely lovely. Now, you see that tail swishing? That's very common for the elephants to kind of keep tabs on where the other elephants are. And especially with the females, with the babies, you'll often see them just smacking very lightly their baby just to make sure they know exactly where that baby is. There we go, there's a bit of sparring going on now. Yeah, I think he probably is around his 30s, mid 30s, that bull doesn't have very deep indentations in his skull. The length of the tusks are controlled by the genes, but you can generally get a gist of uh, how old they are as well through the tusks. You can kind of, but as I say, you can't just go off of that because it is determined by genes. So some elephants are able to grow much larger tusks than others. It's certainly looking at the indentation in the head, the height of the animal. Now, I'm wondering if these ladies are actually patiently waiting for us to move. I think maybe they're wanting to walk up onto the damn wall, so I'm wondering if it's worth us moving back and letting them come up here. Because there's one lady just looking at us of this, say, are you going to move anytime soon? So I'm going to see if that's what she wants us to do. And I think we've got something just to finish off that sighting for you. So I think we're going to cross over to Byron and have a lovely sunset. Oh, there's well a zebra enjoying the sunset. A beautiful golden light on it at the moment. Still up on the on the termite mound. Very, very beautiful sight. Annaban, this is known as the Birchall's zebra. It's not a subspecies of zebra, it's just a, a species of zebra. Um, so I think it's Ecus, Ecus Bircelli. 
if I'm not mistaken, the Birtles Zebra or the Plains Zebra, also known as the Plains Zebra. Um, so this is Echos Bercelli. And let me double check my... Uh, no, I beg your pardon. So it seems to... Unless, unless I'm completely mistaken, it seems to have changed. Echos Quacha is the is the scientific name for the plains zebra which is this zebra or the birch i mean it used to be called the birchal zebra and now it's echus quacha the plains zebra i must actually double check because this book of mine is a little old it's from when i started training <laughs> so, it's, it's a little old. I may have to invest in a new mammal book. Perhaps I've discovered new mammals since then. <laughs> uh, now, we only have three species down in uh, southern Africa. We've got the plains zebra. And then we've got two other species known as the Cape Mountain zebra found kind of the southern central part of South Africa in the Karoo and that is the Cape Mountain Zebra down well obviously down in the Cape and you might be able to see let me show you quickly this is the Cape Mountain Zebra and that one see the stripes don't go all the way down the belly they stop in very white belly those stripes are a lot closer together and then um, and then the other one is the Hartman's Mountain Zebra Sorry, this is the plain zebra, which we see. You see how those stripes go all the way down, the, right around the belly. Stripes much wider apart and that prominent brown shadow in between the black and white stripes. And then the, the other one over here is the Hartman's Mountain Zebra. And that one is found up in northwestern South Africa. So right up, uh, almost in the, well, actually in the Kalahari, and then up into Namibia. That's the Hartman's Mountain Zebra. Looks very similar to the Cape Mountain Zebra. So those are the three species we get down here. All right, well, I think, Senzo, shall we ride off into the sunset? Let's carry on and see what else we can find. <laughs> you can just call me John Wayne from now on, everyone. And um, my horse, Wendy. And we will be on our way into the sunset. <laughs> All right, it sounds like Tara's found herself in an interesting situation. Elephant are blocking her way. Let's go have a look. Yep, yep, they do. So we're gonna try and check out what's going on along Twin Dams Road. So the elephants did decide to go off this way, um, but there's a couple of young bulls who are busy sparring just on the road there, just up ahead of us, while the rest of them disappear through into the open area. The other young bulls are Oh, splashing around. Oh, sorry. Making their way into the water there. Just while the rest of the herd are making their way off into the open area. So that is just lovely to <laughs> With the youngster still looking on, amazing. <laughs> I want to be an elephant now and play in the water. It's just a little bit too cold for me as a human. <laughs> but that looks like a lot of fun. Oh, and we've got the little youngster gonna go have a go at the blacksmith lapwing again. <laughs>
Come on, little one, you're getting left behind. Hi, Yana. Yana asking if I've ever been charged by an elephant. I have. Uh, there was a female that she was halfway between a warning charge and a full-on charge, but there was enough vegetation between us and her that slowed her down. And it was actually more displacement behaviour than anything, because I think uh, the lions, we think, were in the area, and I think they'd been upset by them. Um, they were a little bit more on high alert than what they normally would do, so I stopped quite a distance from them, a good 80 metres or so, and maybe more. And it just got to breaking point and she decided she was going to displace her behaviour towards to me. And uh, she came for us, but she, as I say, she had to go around the bushes a little bit, so she didn't have a full charge. So by the time she got to us, she had slowed down quite considerably. And I just thought, something said to me in my head, don't shout. So I just said, hey lady, what's this? And it almost broke her concentration. And she stopped about four metres from us, something like that. But sometimes, whatever you do, it's not going to stop them and you just have to get out of there. And it's trying to know when that's going to be because sometimes if you actually move that triggers them to follow and that sort of changes the behavior to actually follow through so it's trying to read that behavior of when they are just warning you or where you know where the best thing to do is to actually get out of there if it is a full-on charge but obviously we try and avoid getting into that situation in the first place but the more you go into the bush the higher the possibility of actually having an instant like that because I say every day is different and you do what you can to limit it and sometimes you find yourself in that situation but these boys are having an absolute party <laughs> I was going to say jaw but I suddenly realised people aren't going to really understand that but that's what we call a party down here in South Africa Hi Jason, Jason asking why elephants spar. Um, they're actually learning how to place their tusks, where to place their tusks, learning what uh, their capabilities are, they're building up the muscles, so when the day comes that they really have to do this for real, and they're fighting over a female, because they're not territorial, it will be over a female, then they know what to do. So this is all very important behaviour for them. Now, like I was saying earlier, you can't really go off just tusks alone. Uh, some elephants will grow longer tusks than others. And you can see these two boys, they do actually have different sized tusks, but they look roughly about the same age. Maybe a year or two difference, but not much. But the bull that's now in view, he looks like he's got slightly longer tusks than the bull behind him. He's picking his toes. <laughs> now those feet are very sensitive, so he might have stood on something that he didn't quite like. But yeah, quite quite a big size difference actually, the tusk. You can just about see the tusks of the other male showing through there. Let's say size-wise, there's not much in it. Uh, for the size of the elephant. But yeah, those tusks are probably about three times longer. But they're probably both around early 20s or so. So yeah, the bull on the right, maybe early 20s. Bull on the left, maybe about le mid, mid 20s. Hi, Leah. Leah wanting to know how do you age an elephant? I say it's not an exact science, it is a bit of guesswork. You kind of have to look at everything. So the indentation on the head, um, as I say, the length of the tusk, but as I've just shown, 
you know, there is a big difference between the ages, um, looking at the height of the elephant as well. So these two have got some growing to do. But you try and put everything together, whether they're still with the herd or not, whether they've broken away from the herd. <laughs> Drink break. <laughs> Time out. Well, that doesn't look very nice water. Oh, lovely. So, I think we're going to... <laughs> I think these guys are just enjoying being the stars of the show at the moment. <laughs> So while these two take a time out, I think we're going to cross over to Byron and see a beautiful orange sky with him. <laughs> well, have a look at that magnificent sky that we have. Sunset with a silhouetted yellow-billed hornbill. Isn't that beautiful? Well, off it goes. But that is just really, really, very pretty. Isn't that beautiful? Nice little sunset. Tough day in Africa. <clears throat> well, our afternoon has definitely, definitely been much better than our morning. We, um, when I say we, I struggled this morning. I um, was unable to find very much. I found some warthog. That was about it. Um, but this afternoon, it's been great. We've seen giraffe. We've seen elephant. Um, what else? Oh, the owl. The owl was the highlight for me. The little scops owl. Very beautiful. We started the show with that. So that was a nice little start. Now, there's a vulture sitting in a tree off to my right. It looks like a white-backed vulture. Let's have a look now. Yeah, there are, there were actually a few vultures around here. Um, there are four. There's that one. And then there were another three sitting on a tree behind us. But I don't think it's because of a carcass. Now, occasionally vultures, I mean, well, they do rest at times and they do perch in trees. I think if there was a potential kill around, I think we probably would have seen more. And we would have seen tracks of, of predators in the area. And we haven't seen anything. I've been looking around, so I think maybe these vultures are just resting. At times, you might find one or two vultures fly down and perch in a tree and rest, and then one or two may see them, and then just go and investigate and just see if there is food. But they do rest and perch up in trees, and especially bare trees like that. That looks like a marula from here. I think it is, yeah. And, um, and they luckily not too many branches or leaves around so it's easier for these large birds to land in and and roost in for the night so they will probably end up spending the night here and then tomorrow as the day warms up catch the thermals and start flying around looking for food although you know what everyone i i don't know i'm Doubting myself a little bit. Now, I'll tell you why. Hold, hold on a second. Let's, uh, let me show you something. Now, we're just going to move away from this vulture a little bit. Now, there goes another vulture that just took off from that tree. 
That's not really what I'm worried about. Just give me a second. Now I've spotted another bird of prey. Now this makes me curious. Uh, let's see if we can get it from here first. I don't want it to fly away. Straight ahead, Senzo, you've probably spotted it already. There we go. Do you see that? That is a Batelier Eagle. You see it sitting in there. Now, why I say I'm curious is because the Batelier is actually a scavenger. Batelier and Tawny Eagles are both scavengers. And they often will go and get to a carcass or a kill before the vultures do. And the reason for that is these eagles fly a bit lower than the vultures and their, their eyesight is also very good. And they will try and get in and scavenge off a kill before the big vultures arrive. There we go, you can see it again. So as a, oh. <laughs> Senzo just had a little moment there quick. <laughs> Yana, you asked what is my favorite bird of prey, and that is a uh, Marshall Eagle. Marshall Eagle is my absolute favorite. Now, this, uh, as I was saying, with these, well, the sign of this uh, um, Batelier Eagle around, I, I don't know, I think... <laughs> Because now there are a lot of vultures around, so that would make me think. Because there is a bird of or bird of prey that's a scavenger, a um, a little batelier eagle, and then of course these vultures are around, dotted around here. I wonder if there wasn't anything that that maybe died of natural causes. I can't smell anything. I haven't seen tracks of anything. No sign of lions around. So I I don't know. I don't know. However, this little area that we're in, I think these Batelier, I think they've got a nest nearby. I know even James used to see them around here. Yeah, there was a juvenile Batelier around for a long time in this area. So I wonder if they don't have a nest nearby. That would make sense. And then the few vultures dotted around, possibly just resting for the night. Um, if there was a carcass, we may see them fly down and, and sit on the ground, possibly, if there aren't any predators around. I don't hear anything, don't smell anything. I don't think there's a carcass here. But it's always good to have a look. Now Snazzy, you asked if different scavenger birds would fight at a kill. Uh, definitely, Snazzy, definitely. Now, the best examples I can give are... Usually what happens is the birds to arrive first at a carcass, the birds of uh, all scavengers, it's, uh, let's say the, um, the vultures for example, you'd have the hooded vulture, they often get there first, because they are the smallest of the vultures that we get out here. So they arrive first, then often the um, white-backed vultures will arrive, and if it's a big carcass you may get... Do you want to get the sunset there, Senza? Do you want the silhouette with the vulture? Okay, hold on a second. We might have a beautiful silhouette of a vulture on a dead tree with the sunset. Oh, this could be very good. Senzo, we might be a little too low. Uh, hold on. What about that? Senzo, is that okay? I think that's lovely. Look at that. Yeah, you know, vehicle positioning, Senzo. <laughs> Um, so as I was saying, Snazzy, the, the hooded vultures and the whiteback vultures often get, um, get to carcasses first. But, um, but the leopard-faced vultures, when they arrive, these other vultures quickly make space for them. Those are the largest vultures. They can get quite aggressive. They're really big, really powerful. And I've seen these other vultures move out the way very quickly. So, yes, they will definitely fight at a carcass and chase one another away. Um, and then, of course, the big marabou storks, they may chase a vulture or two away, or they'll feed on one side and let the vultures feed on another side. Lovely silhouette of a vulture. Oh, 
Ah, oh, Laura Moore, you say the cameramen are such artists, they are indeed. But this is a lovely view. Can we brighten it a little bit? Let's just see. Mm, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. No, that's fine. And there is our sunset, our afternoon sunset. Oh, this would be a perfect time to stop and stretch our legs and have some sundowners with guests and just listen to the bush a little bit and maybe something alarm calls and alerts us to where there might be a predator moving around sounds like some aramark babblers calling not far from me Oh, that's very beautiful. Eh? Isn't that lovely? I still think the the best silhouette I've ever had on Safari Live was with some of you might remember. It was I think it it was last year. Um if I'm not mistaken, I think it was last year. Um but it was of a brown snake eagle perched in a tree similar to this and just beautiful clouds and the sunset the colors were magnificent but that shape of the brown snake eagle silhouette was really amazing and that I must I must be honest I think that's one of the best silhouettes I've ever had Well, I think shall we continue and let's go see Oh, we still got a little bit of light if we don't get some tracks or find something moving around Now, apparently a lot of you were wondering <laughs> because I mentioned that I was such a big flower fan <laughs> what my favorite flowers are so favorite flowers easy in the bush two flowers the leopard orchid and cilia africana beautiful beautiful um, uh, leopard orchid that we get out here yellow and brown flowers and the other one is the impala lily scientific name not remembered <laughs> I'll have to look that up I forgot the scientific name of the impala lily but uh, the, the beautiful white and pink flowers very bright very vibrant and usually in winter that's where all they are they flower in winter so everything else is bare and barren you get these wonderful impala lilies flowering at the moment well hang on a second everyone look what we have here wait <laughs> Uh, let me just look for a gap quickly. Uh, oh, Senzo, I can't find a gap now. Maybe through there, hold on. Oh no, hold on. <laughs> Trying to find a gap, I'd like to show you all something quickly. Is that okay, Senzo? Beautiful sunset off to our left. That's stunning. Really, really wonderful. And then 
off to our right, I see a bad moon rising. <laughs> Let's have a look up there quickly. <laughs> Just above the trees. And the beautiful moon. Look at that. Almost full moon. Not quite yet. I think another day or two. It's uh, judging by the time and that. And yeah, another. I mean, it looks full. It looks full, but it's not full yet. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> when I used to guide permanently. Justin, you say this is too beautiful. This is wonderful. This is really, really wonderful. But um, when I used to guide full time, when we had a beautiful full full moon rise. Ah, sorry, Senzo was just pointing something out to me. He says it looks like there's a footprint on the moon. If you look the top left-hand side of the moon, um, what, what would you say, Senzo? Three toes and a back pad. So a honey badger missing two toes. Huh? A three-toed honey badger. That's what Senzo says. Walked on the moon because of the back pad. It looks like there's a... Um, there, there are different uh, sections to the back pad. I agree with you, but I'm not sure how it lost its two toes. But I get what you're saying, Senza. I think so. So, if any of you were wondering, yep, a honey badger has walked on the moon. <laughs> oh dear, Senza, maybe we've been out here a little too long. Um, so, as I was saying, when I guided permanently. We, myself and one or two other guides, as soon as we got a beautiful full moon rise, we would kind of uh, recite the words to um, I See a Bad Moon Rising by Creedence Clearwater Revival. Um, I don't know if anybody really enjoyed it, but I thought it was quite funny. So I would say, um, Richard uh, confirm do you see a bad moon rising he would say a firm I see a bad moon rising and someone else would say well don't go around tonight <laughs> it's bound to take your life there's a bad moon on the rise <laughs> oh dear James is gonna kill me for singing I can just I can see the 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 angry texts coming through already from James Asking me what the hell am I doing? <laughs> okay, well, it sounds like Tara's managed to fight off and fend off some gremlins, but she's got some birds in the road. I'm assuming they're Franklins. Let's go and have a look and see. We've actually got an Atel spur file there with some babies. There was actually about four chicks that ran from the road. So there's one just, oh actually there's two just in the top left of your screen. And then there's another one with the adult there. How sweet are they? <laughs> The tail spur file. You can see those bright orange bill and legs really standing out in the bush there. But it takes both parents to raise the young. So even though the young are capable of finding food for themselves once they hatch out, the parents still need to be around to defend them. And there they go, disappearing into the bush. Oh, that was so sweet though. <laughs> Very, very cool. So we've just checked along the riverbed, the Milwati, to see if there is any sign of those leopard tracks, or indeed the cat that made them. Unfortunately, there, it looks like the elephants have actually uh, pushed over a tree. So unfortunately, we couldn't get that far. We got to probably about opposite us now. So we're gonna carry on heading back towards Gary Dam and just see if we've got 
any alarm calls as we go something that might tell us that a leopard is there i've i'm convinced that leopard's going to be heading towards gary dam i don't know why uh, possibly because all the animals are around there but i'm hoping my feeling is right keep your fingers crossed that would be absolutely amazing to see the leopard they really are building themselves up for me <laughs> i think i'll be very upset if i don't get a chance to see them before i leave because as you know they are one of my greatest loves and absolutely fascinating animal i think there it is is it there is it there is it there no it's a bush buck <laughs> just disappearing oh i thought that was just so poetic then <laughs> Oh, I'm on tender hooks. <laughs> Eyes are peeled. Not that it is just a bush book, but it would really be nice to see them. <laughs> yeah, definitely holding thumbs, everybody. Thank you so much. I know you guys have had two leopards the other day. Tandy and Hosanna, I nearly forgot his name then. That's a new name for me. And I think we have some really fantastic interaction there. And we think that there was actually a mating pair scene uh, heading east from, uh, sorry, heading west from Voyatella Lodge into the block somewhere between Aubrey's and Sandy Patch uh, yesterday morning. It was possibly, it was possibly uh, Tandy or Shadow, I'm not entirely sure who. We think possibly Tandy, maybe seen with Tembo, which would make sense with maybe why Hosanna was around. Maybe he was picking up on her being in Estrus. But while we carry on, seeing if we can find any sign of the leopard. I think we're gonna cross live to Jamie in the Mara with some of the animals crossing. Enjoy that, that would be spectacular. And welcome to the disembodied voice part of this afternoon's Sunset Safari, where I narrate over one of our river cams here in the Masai Mara, and in this case, the main north river cam, where, as you can see, a gathering of wildebeest has started on the banks. It seems as though it's crossing time once again. Just a quick introduction, because otherwise I'm going to continue, well, I'm going to continue to be a disembodied voice. My name is Jamie, and this afternoon I will be con controlling the camera so if it you know suddenly veers off wildly off to the left or off to the right that is entirely my fault and what we're watching at the moment is pretty standard crossing behavior the wildebeest know they have to cross the river they also know that within the river there are crocodiles and in this case a grumpy hippo that is strutting along through and trying to show off just how big he is the hippo don't like the wildebeest particularly either and so as a result, the wildebeest gather together on the banks, looking somewhat terrified. And eventually, one of them will be brave enough to take the plunge. Which one is it going to be in this case? Oh, little internal skirmish there. All of these herds gather together, lots of males, lots of females. And as a result, the males tend to spend a lot of time fighting off rivals. Watch this hippo disappear, it's astounding. Now, Rita, you would like to know if the wildebeest signal to each other if there is danger around. Yes, by running away. That is essentially the way that they signal to each other, at least at the river crossings. When you're looking at a situation where there is a lion, for example, and the wildebeest have spotted it, what they'll often do is a sort of a... <sighs> <sighs> sound. I don't know how accurate that was, but it's as close. What was that? Did anyone else see a head pop up over the left there? Is there a line there? Did I imagine that? Did anyone else see the head on the left? I saw a bird, but I thought I saw a head pop out of the bank. I did see lions on the river cameras earlier, but not at this crossing, but one not too far away. Let's just keep an eye on that. I can't quite work out if I imagine that. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. 
I'm not 100% sure, and unfortunately we're on the northern end of Main North, which means that we only have a long distance view of the gathering wildebeest. Let's just see if I can spot anything. I can't work out if, I, if I'm going completely mad. Is that a... Uh, hmm... I'm desperately trying to see. I think I'm going to stay at this position. I think that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to stay and watch these wildebeest. Earlier I narrated, I can't remember if I narrated the crossing or if I was just looking. I think I was just looking because the crossing was already halfway through. And I was so distracted by the wildebeest climbing up onto the opposite ends of the bank that when I returned the camera to where they'd originated from, I'd completely missed the lion kill right out in the open and I got some serious death stares from people who were in here with me for messing that one up so I think I'll stick there for now uh, we were talking about warning each other of danger I don't know whether any of you have ever watched that YouTube animation of the wildebeest gathering on the crossing and the, the one is trying to convince the other one without speech, but with just little speech bubbles, that the log that they're looking at is in fact a crocodile. But I cannot help but see that every time I witness one of these crossings. That's what's going through my head the entire time. Log, crocodile. Log, crocodile. Ah, now apparently, Ta how funny is that? Tara's on the same page, and I'm so sad that I'm missing her while she's at Juma. I would have loved to see her again, and I hope she's having a fantastic time. I did see the mouse running away from the, oh, the lion running into the, no. The mouse running into the lion, and terrifying the lion sighting, which is absolutely hilarious. So it seems as though she's been having some good luck. And apparently Tara was hoping that I'd seen that animation. I have. It's hilarious. And I had to laugh when I saw that somebody had put it on Brent's Facebook. I think it's the sound effects. Oh, there's a yellow-billed stalk that just crossed in front at the bottom left of your screen. I'm reluctant to follow it, though, in case I miss a lion popping out. There's something in the wildebeest body language there. Are they looking? Where are you looking? Who's going to be brave enough? There's mom and little one. You know what I find quite heartbreaking is when you end up on the opposite side of a river crossing and the poor separated youngsters and mothers racing up and down, calling, contact calling to each other constantly. Very sad. Poor things. Although I did witness a reunion which was relatively joyous. Mother running from, I mean it was, move, it was, it was like something out of a movie or a film with the female running flat out from one side and the baby running flat out from the other side and then coming together with great relief and then the baby immediately having a chance to suckle. Maybe it was water that I saw splashing. Or maybe there's a hippo there hiding on the... Maybe it's a hippo breathing out because I just saw a little bit of spray there. Whoops, sorry. I hope you're not prone to motion sickness. There's a slight lag on this camera. Now, Mercedes, here's the confusing thing about the crossings. I think it might have been a hippo that I saw. Here's the confusing things about the crossings. So Mercedes' question is about when do they next cross back or do they stay there for good? Sometimes you get crossings going in the opposite direction. So during the migration, it all becomes a little bit confusing. There's rain on one side of the reserve, then there's rain on the other side of the reserve, and the grass is a little bit greener for a little bit longer. So the, I think it is a hippo. The wildebeest and the zebra do move backwards and forwards, so there's no saying. One wildebeest, one individual might go across the river and not cross it again until in another five months time when it's time to migrate back in the same direction that they've come from. Or it might move backwards and forwards several times over the river. It's impossible to say for certain. But they do often cross backwards. Which seems so pointless, doesn't it? Running that gauntless, gauntlet more often than necessary. See? 
the wildebeest looking for the crocodiles. Riti, the herd doesn't really have a head. So Riti was wondering if the head of the herd will forge across the river first, risking life and limb for the rest of the group. It doesn't really work like that. Remember, this is made up of, this herd is not one unit of wildebeest. It's, it's several different units all clustered together. And so it either happens to be the bravest wildebeest that jumps in, or it happens to be the one that's been pushed so hard from behind by the other wildebeest that it's kind of had to either jump in or fall in. Oh, there's a little bit of wildebeest action at the back. And one male that's looking in the wrong direction off to chase a rival. So no, it's not the head of the herd. Although I think um, it would be something interesting to see what the head of the herd would have to say. Okay, we're going to sit patiently and wait to see whether or not these wildebeest decide to take the plunge while they bumble about on this side of the river. Let's go all the way back to South Africa where Byron is doing some bumbling of his own. Well, I am indeed. I'm searching the trees for owls. I'm searching for leopard. I'm searching for everything, really. <coughs> <clears throat> Nothing just yet. Hold on a second. Sorry, I can hear someone calling me on the radio. It might be Tara. Go ahead. I'm about to come out on Twin Dams Road. I'm just south of Chelepan. Okay, copy that. Thanks, Tara. I think uh, Tara's in search of a leopard. Apparently, they had leopard tracks around here. I'm not sure where he's gone, but. But I think we'll um, we'll have a look around and just see if we have any luck or any sign. Maybe you never know. Rottweiler. Interesting question. You asked if all the predator species were the same weight and size, which one would be the more dominant? My guess would be... I'm torn, actually. I'm torn between two. I'll tell you why. Um, I, no, I think leopard. I think a leopard would be... Senzo, what do you think? Wild dogs. Not a chance, buddy. Not a chance. <laughs> oh, so we've got a massive debate now, Rottweiler. Do you uh, uh, yeah. Oh, no. I don't know. I think leopard. Power to weight ratio. That cat is amazing. That cat is really amazing. I've seen a pride of lions attack a male leopard and it stood its ground and managed to fight them, fend them off. And keep them at bay. Now, think if that leopard was the same size as a 140 or 160 kilogram lion, when a male leopard's only about 80 kilograms. I rest my case. Wild dog, slender, fast runners, long distance runners, but I don't think they're powerful enough to deal with the leopard, um, fast, agile leopard. <laughs> hey, Senza. I don't know. I don't know. It's I, my my guess. It would be interesting what Tara thinks. We can ask her just now. I'm just having a look, scanning these trees carefully here. We often hear the owls in these areas along the drainage lines. Alright, well, 
it sounds like Tara is also scanning trees at the moment. Let's go and see if she's had any luck with owls and ask her what she thinks about your question, right, Viola? That's a really interesting question, Rottweiler. Yeah, we've got another Nyala to our right. I think we're going to leave those now because we did see them nicely in the light. So we're just scanning for any sign of the nocturnal creatures now. With any look, maybe an owl, seems we have Craig on board. But um, yeah, I'm pondering that question actually because if all the cats are the same size, then they would have the same capabilities. So the cats would kind of be one, if you like, apart from the cheetah. The cheetah would still not be that strong, sorry boys, compared to leopard or lion. But it depends, are we just talking about African animals? Are we talking about the animals worldwide? Because then throwing bears in the mix, I think, Bears might just be slightly more dominant. If a grizzly was the same size, maybe as the cats, I think possibly they might win strength-wise. Depends on what size we're talking about. I mean, and also what what we are, what what yeah, what sort of size we're talking about. If it's the size of lions or whether it's the size of leopards because the African wild dog I think was Senzo's and the African wild dog actually has this one of the strongest bites to body ratio so even though the hyena has a stronger bite it is a larger animal uh, we've got the elephant herd just coming out to our right I'm just going to switch the spotlight off because elephants don't like the spotlight. Are you going to walk in front of us, lady? I don't know. What do you think, Craig? What would you go for? Mm. Yeah, if we're not throwing bears into the mix, I think, yeah, I think I'm, I'd go with the cats. Wow, look at that shocking pink sky. <laughs> the silhouette of the elephants. There's our little family group moving off to join the rest of the herd. I heard a big branch breaking somewhere up ahead. Another day is drawing to a close. Obviously for some, but the day is just beginning for others. So fingers crossed, we still have some drive time left. So I'm still hopeful, still hopeful. <laughs> Diana, welcome on board. And we're certainly gonna try our best to try and show you some nocturnal animals asking what type of nocturnal animals we have out here. Oh, we have a whole range, but they are very, very secretive. I think just because there's a little elephant there, we're gonna avoid him. He obviously didn't want us to, to shine the light on him. It's funny, they really don't like spotlights being shone on them at all. So we have uh, the genets, and the genets are literally about the same size as a small domestic cat. So you're looking at this sort of body length, very, very cute, very long ring tail. So if you know what a ring tail lemur looks like, just imagine a ring tail on the end of a, a domestic cat, and that's pretty much what a genet looks like. Then you have a civet, uh, also black and white. Looks, It's about the same size, if not slightly larger than a raccoon. Um, so you're looking about that sort of body size without the tails, about that sort of height. Um, relatives of the slender mongoose that we were trying to see earlier and the dwarf mongoose. Uh, that's the white-tailed mongoose. We have seen them a few times here. So they also body size about that sort of length, about that sort of height. 
servals, which are spotted cats um, from the dashboard. They stand maybe about that sort of height. Very large ears for trying to detect rodents in the long grass. And they also come out during the day as well. Uh, we also have caracal around. So a lovely red cat or roy cat in Afrikaans because of the rusty red colour. Aardvarks would be amazing to show you. They actually look a bit like a kangaroo <laughs> crossed with, I suppose, a, a pig with an elongated nose and elongated ears, but they've got a very big muscular tail. And uh, actually a colleague of mine saw an aardvark uh, being harassed by a couple of jackal, actually, which are another nocturnal animal, a little bit larger than a fox. And the jackal were irritating it so much, uh, I think nipping at its tail, and the aardvark actually turned around and punched one. <laughs> I guess they've got pretty big forearms and muscles. So uh, they might not move very fast, although I have seen them move. They actually, there was one that ran around the vehicle twice and he actually bounced a bit like a kangaroo, which was quite amazing. I didn't realize they moved like that. So we're going to carry on looking for some of those nocturnal creatures that I've just mentioned. And I think Jamie has quite a spectacular show to show you. <laughs> Graham, please shut door. <laughs> I'm trying to keep things a little bit more silent in this general direction, but I have spectacularly failed. However, what we have to show you out here is the approaching weather conditions. Now, this is the crossing that the wildebeest were at, and just have a look at the intensity of this particular storm. Look at the lightning rolling in. In fact, oh goodness. It is really, truly ominous looking out here. And if you have a look at the wind, you can see the clouds of dust blowing. It's almost as though there is a crossing happening, but it's just the wind blowing the dust backwards and forwards. And then if Lou, if we could, it actually might be quite nice to switch to dusty crossing, which looks even more ominous. I mean, dusty looks really, truly terrifying. Look at this, look how dramatic the sky looks. And when I look outside, it's actually quite weird. I look outside and I see a lightning flash out of the window and then I can see it sort of corresponding with the crossings lighting up. The wildebeest have scattered, they've decided that this really is not the weather for a crossing. Just not the day for it. And one can hardly blame them. I wouldn't want to have to cross in that weather either. It is really quite scary. Let's go back to Maine North. You can see it's pouring with rain. James, of course, is out there somewhere possibly a bit windswept and maybe a little bit of damp. Hopefully he's found somewhere to bunker down, somewhere safe and secure, because it really is a serious storm on its way. And even though, I mean, this is not the rainy season in Kenya, um, or at least in the Masai Mara, but that doesn't mean it doesn't rain. It rains all year round, so it is bucketing down. And then if you have a look at Maine South, actually, up to the mountain towards where we are, doesn't look that bad at all. Look at that. But it's blowing in our direction. So on the other crossings, you were looking to the south. If you look at, the, if you compare the way that the water was flowing, this way you're looking to the north and in the direction of where I'm sitting up at the top of the mountain. Mm, very ominous. And I think it's safe to say that there are not going to be any crossings anytime soon. And in fact, it's starting to get a little bit too dark for all these cameras. So for now, um, the team in the Mara Migration Control, which consists of me, will be saying a farewell to you all. And we'll send you back to the hopefully dry Byron in South Africa. I am indeed dry. Jamie, thank you very, very much. And thanks, James. He was on earlier, our team in the Mara. And we've got a little scrub here. Look at those ears twitching, listening very, very carefully. They're very alert. It's a thumper. <laughs> I can 
hear Sculps Owls calling in the distance. Uh, always nice to see those little scrub hairs, nocturnal creatures that we do see from time to time. Now, I haven't been able to find another owl. I've been looking, but no sign, no sign. You could just hear the Scops owls, Scops owls calling in the distance up there. Maybe we bump into one up there. But it's been a wonderful day, an elephant afternoon, definitely. Loads of elephant for both Tara and myself. And that is always wonderful. No cats today though. But maybe tomorrow, you never know. Maybe tomorrow we have a pride of lions and some leopards. Uh, who knows? Who knows what the morning holds for us on our sunrise safari? Just having a look. We've still got a minute or so left. Really hope you've enjoyed our Sunday sunset safari with all of us and I hope you are all having a great weekend or the end to the weekend. Hope you had a great weekend. It's now finished. Back to work. Tomorrow morning is going to be my last drive for this stint. So I will be saying goodbye tomorrow morning for a while. And then I'll be back again at some point. <laughs> But um, thank you again to everyone. Tara and Craig, thank you on the other vehicle. Um, and of course, the Prince of Kenya, Senzo. <laughs> Thanks, Senzo. I, I keep mocking Senzo because he returned from Kenya looking like a Kenyan. I think he bought all, the, all their whole outfit and wore it. <laughs> and wears it around camp. And of course, a big thank you to all of you, the viewers, for the questions, comments. Hope you enjoyed it. And Alice and Chantel in the final control, the voices in my head, as I like to call them. We will see you all tomorrow for our sunrise safari. Good night. Goodbye. Have a wonderful day. Wonderful evening. Bye, everyone. <laughs>